what I've titled my talk this morning, Early in the Week, and I've called it Truthful Lives in Deceitful Times. And when I woke up this morning, I wondered what on earth were you thinking when you wrote that down? And that was um, amplified as we left home and drove into the fog, and I thought, oh my goodness, I can't see the way to go frontwards confidently. But then just like it says in the reading, the fog lifted and there was the bright light, and I thought, it's going to be just fine. And one of the points that I would like to lay out for you right at the beginning is that there is not a soul born into experience on planet Earth who does not face some form of adversity or another. There is no escaping it. Trouble seeks us out and threatens to overcome our best hopes, our most passionate dreams. Adversity is a fact of life. And the story about King David is a story about one person wrestling with that adversity, that which opposes hope. And David, this week, is in a series of personalities that the lectionary has been setting in front of us over the past weeks. We have heard about persons like Esther and Ruth and Job and others as well. And in each of those stories, we noticed that some circumstance was limiting the hope for fullness of life. And that's how it is with David. David's story has always been dear to me, I think from my youngest days. And perhaps because at the very heart of that story is that day in which the young shepherd boy David goes out to face that great boasting giant, Goliath. And I think that kind of a story is great for a young child's imagination. You are thinking of a couple of or three young children being baptized into the Christian fellowship. Well, they are being baptized into a fellowship that loves telling stories. And as a young boy, the story of David captured my imagination. You see, I grew up in a house that was often troubled by various things. Poverty was a pretty persistent problem. There was also, how shall I put this discreetly, trouble between mom and dad. They didn't always see things eye to eye. And sometimes it could get pretty mean-spirited in the house, particularly on one side of that equation. And I think as a young boy, the idea of something big and boasting, threatening me, provoked anxiety. And the image of the young boy, David, going out to face his problem, Goliath, with a simple slingshot and stone, somehow encouraged me. And over the years of reflecting on that story, I have realized that the picture of this boy shepherd and his great warrior giant presents us a lovely example of what it takes to get through our times of trouble. First of all, on a physical plane, all of the advantage is with the giant Goliath. And so it may seem to each one of us as that particular thing which threatens our well-being rises up to boast against us. Everything seems to be on the problem's side. We could pause to think about some examples, and these are common examples. Cancer in our society is like a boasting giant threatening to overwhelm us and cast us down, robbing us of our delight in life. And it takes something special to face that cancer. And I don't mean by that something special just the resources of medical science or psychology or neighborhood or family that help us, but that deep inward trust in the goodness of God. You see, in the story of David and Goliath, as in the story of David 
through all of its details, is a story about the odds being stacked against the one who we take to be our hero. The only thing I understand that David has going for him in that confrontation is his trust in the goodness of God. So David goes forward when all of his countrymen, his brothers, his fellow citizens in Israel, they're all intimidated by the scale of the problem, by the size of that which opposes them. And they are timid to go out to address it. And David is embarrassed. And he says, this problem is bragging against God and you're going to sit there quietly and allow it? And David gets permission to go and face the problem and he faces it basically on the solid ground of his trust in God's ability to set him free from the challenge that seeks to overthrow him. And David has this throughout his life. He is constantly faced with challenges and the only thing that sustains him along that way is the promise that he has heard in his youth the promise that one day God will set him in a position of authority so that he will be able to rule the nation in righteousness. And that sentiment is reflective of the sentiment at work in the people in the nation at large. That is to say, power is being abused by King Saul. Power is being abused by the priests of the day and it seems as if good people don't have any hope of prospering no matter which way they turn the corruption of their day overwhelms their desire for security and peace David is called to be the one who is going to make the difference He is going to set things right. He is the champion and the hero of the working people of his day. The fishing people, the farming people, the foresting people, the crafts people. All those who by their labors hope to put a little bit of bread on the table, maintain some shelter and perhaps have a little bit on the side to share with family and friends in their times of trouble. But under the arrangements of power, under the leadership of King Saul, the economy is working only for a very few people, those who are closely associated with the royal household, those who have the favor of the king. But the others are considered to be expendable, disposable, and of very little consequence. David is, in the tradition of Israel, the hero and the hope of our common desire for a plain, simple, good life. But we also learn from David that the royal establishment is never going to be able to succeed. David is the first in a long line of kings in Israel and with each king it becomes demonstrably clear that power when it is not governed by the Spirit of God leads to trouble. It leads to confusion. It leads to warfare. It leads to pollution. So David has the role of being God's appointed king But by the time we get to the story of Jesus in the New Testament, that little piece we heard today, an insight has taken root. And that insight is that it is not a mortal king who will ever bring us the peace and security we long for. No human power is adequate. So we see Jesus, like David, in the presence of the power of his day, weak and vulnerable. He's on trial. And he's on trial because he's been calling into question the powers of religion and the powers of the state. And in doing so, he has brought hope to the ordinary people of his day, so much so that the powers are threatened 
and now Jesus is in front of Pilate to be tried and to be condemned to death for some crime which is unspecified. Although in this text it suggests that Pilate has the idea that Jesus is trying to set himself up as some kind of ruler other than Herod the king in Jerusalem or Augustus Caesar in Rome. And Jesus says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And what we have come to understand in the Christian faith is that Jesus does not exercise power in the way of either politics or religion. Both are not the way that God has shown us in Jesus. Jesus is a simple person, the son of a mother, the son of a father, a neighbor, a friend. And all he has really done with his life is go about encouraging and supporting those who are hard-pressed by the circumstances of their lives. And he has been doing this, obviously, with the favor of God. Because with each teaching that he teaches, each healing that he undertakes, his popularity with the people grows. And in proportion, the hostility of the establishment powers grows. So we are left with the question, if there is no hope in external power, what does Jesus offer us? And what Jesus offers us is the presence of the living God within us through the Holy Spirit so that the world is going to be changed not from the outside towards the inside, but from the inside towards the outside. So in the light of these two texts, what I would like to do is to encourage you. When it seems that all the structures of power are confused, when it seems that so many negative things have taken hold of our experience as people on this planet, trust in the life that you are living. Trust in your own goodness, even though you know sometimes that goodness gets eclipsed by your not-so-good aspects. You can take hope from David, because David wasn't a perfect person. He made so many mistakes, but through it all he continued to stand firm in his trust that God would work things out towards the good. And so I'd like you to trust in God's goodness in you, even being aware of your own limits. And not only just yourself, but the friendships that you make in your families, in your communities, work together believing that the difference you can make in your relationships is the most important difference of all. And the great hope of the text The great hope of Jesus having a kingdom that's not like the kingdoms of this world is that Jesus is able to keep us in the light no matter how dark things get. And that, of course, means you have to cultivate your relationship with Jesus. You have to cultivate your relationship with that deep inner sense of God's presence so that you draw from your own own life's experience, the resources that you need to be the kind of person that makes peace and security possible. So I want to encourage you that your life lived truthfully, aware of your limits, aware of your abilities, and trusting in God. If you live such a truthful life, you will bring hope into all of your relations. And that is so very important when so many people are wondering where they can turn for hope, where they can turn for confidence, where they can turn for the promise of peace and security. You cultivate your inner life and you suggest to your family and friends that they too have opportunity to cultivate their inner lives. And as we begin to grow as spiritual persons, 
who knows, but the rising light of that spiritual reality will begin to diminish the deep darknesses of our time. So, as much as you are able, live a truthful life in these deceitful times.